All right, Tara, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, guys. So, so far we have 22 people in this group. Uh, I am really nice. excited that everyone here from Legacy has joined and maybe somebody outside of Legacy. I see a lot of familiar faces. So the first thing I want to thank Tara for being here and uh, I want to give everybody a little bit of an introduction. I know I talked about him for a while, but Tara is a professional tennis player. Uh, he's currently, I think, 112 in the world, has been as high as yeah, 64. Something like that. <laughs> um, has won five ATP Challenger, has won an ATP World Tour 250. I remember my mom actually sending me a lot of pictures from, from that one, uh, looking at the, in Turkey, winning a trophy. So that was really great. Um, he has competed in all four Grand Slams and I think played in the Olympics, which to me, uh, as a, originally from Europe, that's such a big, big deal. So I'm sure for you, I would, we would love to talk to you about that as well. Um, uh, has played a lot of a lot of great tennis players, including beating uh, Djokovic, which I don't know how many people can say that. And I, and I watched the highlights of that incredible. Even the first set, you were like cruising and then coming back. So <laughs> we, we definitely want to hear uh, more about that. Um, just from everyone that's, that's here, feel free to uh, message any additional questions. I got a lot of them, but feel free to message and uh, I'll, I'll make sure we get included as much as possible. So I guess I'll first start with, um, you know, a couple questions that people have is your, your background, you're born in U.S. or trained in Japan. Uh, also trained in Spain. So kind of a little bit about your, your background when you were a junior and how different uh, areas or coaches affected your game to in your junior level. Yeah, um, so basically I was, uh, you know, born in the U.S. in New York and then, you know, straight away uh, our family moved to Japan. Um, and then I basically lived in Japan, you know, until I was 13. Um, and there, I think I learned most of my discipline, um, a lot of the kind of Japanese, uh, you know, kind of obedience and discipline. Uh, I think that was very important for me to have that base to um, keep building on the other stuff I kept learning in Spain later on from when I was 13 until I was 23 or so. So, yeah, um, in Spain, I learned a lot of great things about tennis. I mean, you know, impossible to uh, tell you all about it. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of, you know, very hard work ethic in both Japan and, and Spain. And I think that was basically, you know, the most important factor. And what I could say, I mean, you know, in my career, I guess. Got it. Is there, um, I'll just dig into that from a coaching perspective. Obviously, every country is different and every coach and club is different. Is there something that's more unique, whether it's mentally or physically, to one than the other? You know, everybody talks about Spanish being about footwork and having, you know, good spin and racket head acceleration. So is that a stereotype? And then, you know, Japan discipline and, and, you know, so I'm just wondering what are your thoughts on that as from your own experience? Yeah, I mean, I can put, you know, the three, so three to Japan, U.S. and Spain into three different categories of kind of, you know, different styles of teaching tennis. I would say Japan is very technical, very um, disciplined, and then technical, uh, very like, a lot about having very nice, clean take backs, uh, clean follow through, you know, very compact swings and good quick footwork. But then Spain is more about endurance, um, how to move on clay, hmm. which you don't learn in Japan or in the US. Um, and then a lot about, you know, how to really accelerate. Um, how to move into a ball forward, backwards. And then the US is more about power, speed, um, maybe about more about moving forward and keeping the pressure on the opponent um, in a very offensive manner. Yeah. And yeah, I think those are, you know, the, the three, kind of the most, the biggest differences between the three. Got it. 
No, that's really good to just kind of follow up on the juniors for, for a little bit. Uh, you started playing tennis at seven. Um, I also know that you have a great younger sister, Kana, who most people yeah. don't know. Kana played for uh, my sister at UPenn, was a, played uh, great tennis, got to always to the nationals. And always, I know we always talked about you as well. So um, similar player, very offensive, very great net game. You know, was not afraid to come in. And I, I always liked her. Her style was different than most people you get to see. Was able to grind on yeah. the baseline, but was able to slice and come in, which was so unique. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. she talked to me uh, about her training. So when it, when it comes to you, when you're younger, uh, a lot of people want to know, at what point do you think you want to be a pro? And at what part do you feel like you can be a pro? Because I think those are two different things. I think wanting to be a pro can come very early. Um, I always wanted to be a pro since maybe since I was like nine years old or so, but I only started seeing it as a, as a kind of like a realistic kind of option when I was 13, 14, when we moved to Spain, when we made that big move to Spain, you know, that was when I was like, okay, we're really going for it. Um, but then also, I think my parents did a really good job of, you know, um, being a part of the process, but without being too pushy about um, our tennis. So they were very involved, but in a very together way, not like, uh, you know, you need to make it because we're putting this effort into you kind of. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So... Yeah, uh, like that, basically. <laughs> is there, is there, you know, from 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 that standpoint, and you feeling it, um, what kind of pressure did you put on yourself? So I'll I'll, I'll say that, but kind of going back to, um, if you were 12, 13, 14 years old, um, can you tell me a few things that you're like, I'm really glad I did this, and then some, if you could go back, you would you would change or you would, you know, if there are any things. Um, and I'm talking about that developmental age, you know, like 11 to 16. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's always a very complicated time in our lives. Um, I remember being so, you know, super grateful for being able to pursue, um, yeah, pursue professional tennis, but then also it was a struggle um, being in a different continent and, you know, a lot of the players in the academy we were training in were not around our age. Um, so there was a lot of struggle with finding friends, sacrificing social life. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just a very complicated uh, teenage, you just have to stay calm, you got to keep doing your work. And then, you know, we were never, I never felt like, oh, if I don't make it as a pro, I'm a failure or something. I always felt like, okay, I just keep going at it, keep going at it. It's a very long, long process. That's what you got to realize. Um, you know, like, even if you're doing great right now, five years later, you got to still keep doing well. Um, you know, just got to keep, keep really digging at it. And then you just kind of pass by different obstacles and keep achieving, you know, stuff that uh, – you're surprised by, you know, almost. Hmm. All right. And then I'll, I'll, no, that's really good because I think I really liked how you mentioned that. Well, two things I like that you mentioned the one that the journey continues, that it never ends. And I really like the fact that you said you wouldn't consider yourself a failure, even if you don't, uh, don't achieve it. And I think, uh, especially in us and all of us we set these goals and we have set these expectations whether it's from us or other people and then if we don't achieve them yeah it uh it, it hurts so it, it you know it's how do you balance that love for the passion i guess you got to love the game but also you want this result but it you know i guess i'll follow up with now when you have a match that you lose how do you recover from that like, you know, we, whether it's, yeah. you know, you talk about juniors now, you just lost a tough match. You know, I, I, I can name one just, but you know, if you want to draw from your experience, like how is your, what does that recovery process look like mentally and then how to get back on court? 
Well, I mean, you know, different losses have different amounts of damage. Um, you know, they're, most of the losses don't impact you too deeply. Yeah. Because if it did, I mean, you wouldn't be able to continue playing 30 tournaments a year because yeah. it would be too much up, <laughs> too yeah. much emotional, you know. But still, yeah, it's like a lot of, yeah, a lot of struggle every single week. And I would say like, you know, like an average week where you lose a match where it's not the most devastating week of the year, nor it's like the, you just kind of, you know, there's like this couple hours after the match where you're probably not going to think very logically. You're going to yeah. very, you're going to be acting very emotional, talking out of your emotions, saying, you know, probably saying stuff like, oh, I want to quit tennis or, yeah. you know, those are very, those things. Even professionals say that, that kind of stuff right after they lose. Um, so, but then, yeah, I think the ability to afterwards cool down and be able to think logically, was this a match that was positive for my development in the future um, or not? You know, was I doing the right things and did the opponent just play better than me this time? Um, you just keep thinking about that stuff and, you, you know, you either take a day off the next day or you keep training um depending on if you if you have a tournament the next week or if you have to go back home and you have some time to train at home yeah i mean it kind of depends every week uh but yeah, that's kind of the process there's like the very stressful sad first couple hour first hour or two and then you have like the time where you can actually think more normally when when that happens i i mean i'm i'm glad because uh, I think everyone that plays can relate to that. Uh, so let's go from, from your standpoint, when you have those two hours um, and everyone is different, what do you want to hear from your coach or do you not even want to hear from your coach? What's, what's the status usually for you? Um, I think it really, it, that also depends. I mean, I'm a type of person that can usually talk to the coach right afterwards. So I I would usually like the coach to say, hey, I mean, bad luck, good job, or whichever. And then maybe he lets me, you know, go have a go take a shower and maybe grab a bite to eat and then and then start talking about the match or something. Yeah. Um as opposed to when you win, you know, maybe when you're doing your cool down, you can talk about the match straight away. Yeah. But when you lose, yeah, I mean, maybe yeah, I want the coach to come and say, hey, good job or bad luck or whatever. And then, yeah, maybe have like 30 minutes of whatever shower and quick drink, bite, and then talk about what happened. Got it. Got it. Um, so just real quick, I'm going to take a pause for everyone that's here. I'm about to switch to a different stage of his tennis. So if there's any questions about the developmental stage that uh, message me right now we do we have limited time we have about 15 20 minutes left so uh, if there's any questions feel free to uh, message now i guess the the last question that i'll have for you from from this stage is um when you are at a higher level tournament as a grand slam is there different kind of pressure and different preparation that goes into a match or just in general, what preparation do you do to go into a match? Is it more about playing your game or is it more adjusting to who you're playing? And obviously, you know, like, let's say you're going to, let's put it on that uh, 2018 versus Djokovic. How do you prepare to play someone like that? Yeah. I mean, it's a, uh... You know, the way you prepare for matches kind of change as your game develops. Um, when I was in Spain, I used to be very, like, I only concentrate on my side. Um, and, you know, I won't really adjust my game for the uh, because the other player plays this way or the other way. But after, when I've become more consistently in the top 100 and playing against guys that are, you know, a little bit higher, you know, in the real top of the game, you need to um, assess how the guy plays, which shots he likes, what bothers him. And then, yeah, then the game becomes more complicated. 
and it's that's a that's a step that I've struggled to, and I still am struggling to kind of figure out. Um, because I've always been, yeah, very much like, you know, if if I lose and I play bad, if I win then I play well, but you almost sometimes forget that the opponent's playing, and yeah, he could very well play a very good match too, and but then at the same time you need to. Yeah, really look into what he does, what he doesn't do well, and you know, try and break him down from a very specific, specific game plan. Um, so yeah, with Djokovic, I mean, I guess he doesn't really have any weaknesses. Uh, so I didn't really know what what I just went there, tried to like be very tough and very solid. And then it turned out that he wasn't playing his best tennis that day. So, you know, I was able to take advantage of that. And that was, you know, that's how things are. I didn't hear that. I heard that. I heard that he played his best match ever, but he still couldn't beat you. That's what, (laughs) that's what I heard. So I don't know. You don't need to play that. uh, That's that's not true. That's not true. But I mean, you know, like the thing is like, just because they're top players, it doesn't mean that they don't have bad days. Like they, they have many bad days. They just, they're able to figure it out better than probably the lower ranked players or juniors, how to, how to get through their bad days. But in that day, I was able to really push him when he was not feeling good. So, so well, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, that was, yeah, that, that was, yeah, probably the biggest, you know, key to winning that match. And so let's let's just bring that. I'm gonna bring that then. So you played, you played Djokovic. You've played. I remember I was watching the Rafa U.S. Open match when you won the first set, and I was like, wow, yeah, yeah. you know. And so what what is the the mindset that you feel when you're playing those guys? That's different, you know. Why? Are, like, you know, I don't I don't know if you played Roger. I, I I don't think so. I haven't seen it. No, never. Yeah. yeah. So, so, but let's still say you played two out of three of those guys that have won everything. And you played also the Potro and Vavrinka, the only other people that have won the Grand Slam. So what yeah. currently in the last like 15 years, so what separates them? What do people talk about on the professional tour is like, why are these guys so hard to beat, especially in the Grand Slams? Like they're hard to beat, but in the Grand Slams, it's, it just seems a whole another level so you being so close to that and having done it what what do you feel like or what do people say yeah so they're able to you know just kind of even if they're not playing well they're always somehow finding a way to stay in the match so they never let you win more than let's say like three points in a row like when you're playing maybe someone who's lower ranked than you and the person's playing bad then he can there may be times you win like eight points in a row. And that happens a lot with people that are mentally fragile. Uh, But with these top guys, even if you feel like, oh, they're making, you know, very basic unforced errors, um, they won't do that for two, three points in a row. So they'll miss, yeah, two balls that are very uncharacteristic of them, but then they'll play one good point and always recover, always stay in there. And then there's always a moment where they can switch into another gear. And so you always have to be on top. You always have to be kind of pressuring them and always playing well to be able to kind of, yeah, win. Oh, that's, that's good feedback. I got a couple questions. We'll go take a step back real quick. Uh, from Janae. Hi, Janae. What is your uh, mental game? What do you do after each point? So what are your rituals? Uh, between points um pretty basic you know just you give yourself that like one second to react positively or negatively to a point um and then you breathe and then you neutralize um you kind of listen you kind of you know listen to your thoughts and be like hey what's next i look at my strings i usually ask for the towel towel uh because i sweat a lot you know and then yeah by that time uh 
the next point starting, but also breathing, you know, a lot of exhale uh, is something I've put in to my game the last few matches. Um, Cause I would always try and just inhale a lot. And then that would, you know, always make me panic and kind of run out of breath. But when you exhale really hard, you're able to inhale harder. So that's been something new. Um, but yeah, my in between that specific. <laughs> no, it's good. We have another question uh, asking about uh, sibling rivalry growing up. What was that like with uh, with Kana and the good and uh, how are your guys' relationship now from it? And just what can you tell me about that? Yeah, so I mean, she was always the more talented one when we were younger. Uh, she was definitely the more. Um, she was more the prodigy, kind of the one that uh, all the coaches thought she was going to make the top whatever. And I was kind of just tagging along until, you know, we were like 15, 16. And then, yeah, she struggled a bit more mentally during those times. Uh, but I think, yeah, our relationship right now is very, you know, very healthy. I think she respects the fact that I've been able to keep at it for so long. Um, she took a different path, went to college, you know, now is the independent, uh, self, de self dependent, uh, successful businesswoman in, <laughs> now in Philadelphia. But yeah, mm -hmm. so, you know, I mean, being a professional tennis player is not always for everybody. It's just there's so many things I have to kind of, come into place uh, for it to happen. It's not always about you doing the right thing. It's about, yeah, something's falling into place that are out of their control. What are, what are the things that, going back to that, that you feel like you have, or I don't know if the word is sacrifice. At this point, you, that's just you, but you would say compared to other people, like what is the tough part that people don't see? I mean, I, I'm going to say about traveling and finances and the losses, but, you know, maybe you can go into something different. Uh -uh. Yeah, I think the part that people don't see is probably, I think the financial part is a big part in tennis um, because it's, you know, most of the the financial part of tennis that we see are Federer's and the Serena Williams and the big money at the very top. Um, but even guys like us, you know, I, I do all right, but like the guys, you know, be below me are struggling financially. And that's, you know, something that many people don't realize, uh, you know, being on top 150 in the world is in a sport as big as tennis is being like being in the first division of a, of a first league soccer team in Europe or being in the NBA or being in a, yeah, the major league baseball. So yeah, that's the tough part of tennis. You know, you, even if you're so good, top 150 of the world, you're not going to be, you know, flowing in cash. <laughs> you're going to be, you're going to be doing a little better than losing money. Got it. Yeah. I got, I, no, that's good. Um, I got a couple more questions. So Sean, Sean Clark is asking some difficult questions. He wants me to put you on the spot. He said, you won the first set against Del Potro and Nadal and Thiem. What was so tough about closing these matches out? <laughs> well, so each, each of those matches were a little different. Um, with Thiem, he, you know, made a, he played a bad first set and, I was just able to kind of, yeah, he made, made a lot of mistakes. And then, you know, I was solid. But in the second set, he just picked up that gear and it was like impo almost impossible to kind of keep up with his rhythm. Um, with Del Potro, kind of similar, but I think I played a very good first set. Uh, maybe I started playing a little shorter in the second and then he, you know, he started also pouncing on that. and. I think, yeah, he started showing his level, you know, really top level towards the second and third set. Uh, 
with Nadal, you know, I played an unbelievable, probably the best set and a half of my life. Uh, but then, yeah, with Rafa, five sets, you know, there's so much more tennis left, even if you're set in a breakup. Um, and he just keeps making you play so many balls. So, yeah, I think that's the part of the game I need to improve as well, just kind of keep being able to putting the these top guys out, out of their comfort zone for a little longer. Mm. Wow. I can't, I can't even imagine that, that scenario. So if I, for me, uh, I think that um, adjusting to, like, I think so much of what you're talking about is like playing your game and then adjusting to the other person. So in those three, yeah, guys, yeah. they all have three great forehands. Let, I mean, I, I, mm. I just tell me a little bit about those three forehands and like, you know, I don't, it, everybody wants to know who's the best. They're all three completely different. I guess Rafa and, DM are a little closer to each other, but what's the feeling like when you're hitting the first ball and when they get uh, like uh, uh, into the rhythm, like a couple of two forehands in a row? Because I think that can be a big difference. Yeah, I mean, the thing that surprised me more about these guys is, of course, their forehands are amazing, but their backhands are actually pretty solid. Mm -hmm. You know, like on TV, like their backhands don't seem as good. But, you know, I think um, their backhands are a lot better than it seems. So yeah. it's not, yeah, like when you're attacking that backhand, they still put pressure on you from that side. And then with the forehand, they can do whatever they want when they have the time. Nice. So, yeah. But yeah. I guess this or that, it's not about the, it's, it's about having, a, uh, that's, I always talk about like a sword and a shield. But if your shield, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. is so strong, then you it can become yeah. your weapon as well. So I think that's exactly good. Good to know. That's good. I'll make sure I pass that on to people. A um, couple questions coming in. Uh, Hiromi wants to know what are you able to do to stay active during this time? And it's crazy time. We've talked about that in our pre meeting. But um, you know, what are, what are you doing to stay active physically and mentally and to prepare for when you get back on court? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, for now, I ha I don't, I still uh, don't have to be in quarantine like in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in Japan right now, and the situation here uh, for now, the you know, we're still allowed to use the tennis courts, so I'm able to practice and go to the gym. But what I would recommend for you guys that are not able to go to the courts, um, I don't know how exactly how old you guys are, but I think it's very important to keep. I think keep making it fun when in these boring times maybe uh play games try and try and make a game out of whatever you can you know you in the u.s you guys have bigger space in the house <laughs> compared to us in japan um you guys can try and you know i don't know uh follow some kind of fitness program on youtube or whatever just yeah do anything do anything to not not be on the phone or the YouTube or the PlayStation all day. Like try and set some kind of routine where you do like a certain kind of workout. You do, you know, set a calendar, set like a planner for a day. And that I think will make you stay active easier. I like it. I like it. So staying with that active, next question uh, from, uh, I guess, Lexi Barry. Did you play any other sports growing up? and uh did kind of play any other sports no not really um i i wish that we had a little bit more because the more i play the sport the more i feel like the more you generalize in the beginning um the better specialist you'll become so you know the more sport, the more sports or more disciplined you touch as a young child, it makes you more flexible and more adaptable to different situations when you're older. So you know if you guys are young, you know of course if your ten, uh, if your passion is tennis, keep really going at tennis. But also don't forget to you know if you have time to play soccer or baseball or whatever to just kind of you know keep your field 
keep your brain more plastic, uh, kind of more flexible. I don't like it. Um, if just going going back, I know we're jumping topics here. I just want to make sure that I'm answering. Uh, all, I'm asking all the questions that the kids have. So, yeah. um, what is a what is your? Um, I guess uh, of course every tournament is different, but what is the preparation? leading up to the tournament look like like one week before three days before the night before um do you do you have the same sleeping habits do you change eating habits are they the same or do they change um yeah well i mean you know sleeping habits is a tough one in tennis because uh the schedule we don't you know as you guys know the schedule doesn't come out till the day before and depending on the part of the world you are in they you could play very early like 10 a.m or you could play very late like 7 8 p.m um but yeah like generally a week before the tournament you're still trying to do some hard work you know maybe get some cardio in some like strength work um longer hours on court basically doing like five you know five six hours of work and then when you're three four days before the tournament you start tapering off a little bit do you know four hours of work and then by the time you're the day before the match you i usually just maybe hit like hour hour and a half um and then y'all get prepared for the, the match next day and depending on the time you sleep a little earlier or later to adapt to the condition how how is this different um i know it was a while back so if you can remember let's just pick like 12 13 years old when you were preparing for the matches then what percent do you feel like you prepared at a professional level so if and and i'm not saying obviously it's so different like juniors and pros are so different but for that mindset the mentality of doing those things what percent grade would you give your 13 year old self um 13 year old <laughs> i think i would give myself like uh a b yeah. i think i always had the right intentions i was you know always very serious so i would if i knew what to do physically then i would have done it yeah um i was ready to do the correct warm-ups before the match and maybe the mental resets before going into the court, the routines. Well, obviously at 13 years old, I mean, you know, we didn't know what exactly we had to do right before a match. Uh, and then obviously that, you know, routine changes a lot with time because 15 years, 10, yeah, 15 years ago, the way people warmed up, warmed up and went into the matches were very different to the way people go into the matches now. You know, now it's a lot more professional, a lot more specific. Before, 15 years ago, it was just basically, okay, do some side steps, you know, run around the field one lap and then go on the court. It was yeah. a lot more simple, yeah. So with, with, uh, with that theme, then I'll kind of stick with a couple more questions on my end. What do you think are the best five-minute exercises or – I just pick up a, a number for kids that are good for injury prevention. Like what do you do before, you know, ban with your bands, or do you have any recommendation? Cause that's the one thing that I, that kids, you know, they're like, I, even if they do the warm up, they just want to go hit. And then the cool down, it's yeah, such yeah, a hard yeah. thing for me to talk yeah, about. Yeah. But then as soon as you get older and you get a couple of injuries, your mind changes. But yeah. how do you, how do you prevent that? Um, you know, it's impossible to really put it into five minutes, but I think as tennis players, um, very, very, very important to do external rotation work with your, uh, you know, with your shoulders, because all of our force, all of our strength is going in inward. Yeah, internal rotation, which means that you're pulling things into your body but you want to have the strength to pull things out like you know with the bands when you're going like that mm -hmm. but when you're going that way the so stuff like that is very important for shoulder 
health. Um, yeah, and then I mean, you know, you would need to ask physical trainers about that. They would be very happy for you to do external rotation work. I mean, that's, um, I think that's one of the most simple but most effective ways to avoid injuries, at least on the upper body. Well, the one thing I'll just say for everyone that is here, I have a great PDF of all those internal external band exercises. So if you want, email me after that I can send to you guys uh, from the from the USTA, which brings me to I, I have three more questions because I don't want to take up too much of Tara's time. But if anyone has additional questions, this is the time uh, to ask and I'll definitely try my best to add them in there. Um, my questions to you are regarding playing Olympics. Uh, what was that ceremony, like opening ceremony and that whole experience? Can you tell me a little bit about that? That's my own question. I'm more interested about that. than Yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Olympics was such a surprise for me because I, you know, I was initially not in the list. So I ended up getting in because a lot of people pulled it out because of the Zika virus. Um, I mean, the Zika mosquito, yeah you know, that was four years ago. Um, so I was very lucky. I was, you know, called. We have the last. Corona, Corona four years later. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I was very lucky. I got in last minute and I just, I, it was so fun. Like it, it was probably the funnest week of my life in tennis for sure. Because I didn't really care about my results there, you know. I was just so happy about happy about being there, just seeing a bunch of different athletes from the world in one same place. Um, and yeah, I was just really enjoying myself. And opening ceremony was crazy. The stadium, you know, the soccer stadium that probably fits like a ninety, ninety or hundred thousand people, full of people. And yeah, uh, it was crazy, crazy. I mean. Any any surreal, celebrity yeah. stories? Any did you get starstruck by anyone? Is there anyone you saw that you're like, oh? Uh, yeah, I saw Usain Bolt, but from kind of you know a few few feet away, and he was getting a lot of picture requests. So <laughs> I didn't really get, I wasn't really able to get too close to him. But other than that, not really. I mean, you know, we had this thing where every country had like a like a pin that you would put on your badge um, and you would exchange your country's pin with another country's. Mm -hmm. So I was super occupied with, you know, trying to collect as many badges <laughs> as possible. <laughs> yeah. Do you still, do you still have those pins and badges? Yeah, I'm sure I do somewhere. Um, <laughs> it doesn't seem as important to me now as it did when that four years ago. But, it was like Pokemon yeah. go, just the Olympics. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kind of. Nice. Very nice. Um, I, I have two more questions. Again, I'm just going to go from my end. And anyone else, feel free to type in some questions. Um, going forward now with your career, what are, you, what are you looking to add or improve or work on your game? Um, so I hopefully you have now 24 new fans. So now they're going to watch you play. So when they're watching you play, what should they see on court? What have you been working on? Yeah, I mean, I've been working a lot on, you know, I got a new coach, uh, Sven, Sven Groneveld. He was, uh, he coached Maria Sharapova for a long time. So, um, and also, you know, Caroline Wozniacki and all those uh, really top WTA girls. So, um, yeah, it's a big investment of my part to, work with him and you know he's been really good at you know just kind of giving me very specific details in order for me to transfer more weight onto the ball to be able to be way more aggressive uh without being using too much effort you know what I mean um my game is always solid I make very little unforced errors but I need a little bit more push that extra gear in order to be able to su keep surprising the opponents so yeah uh, i think you know maybe some kids have seen that i have a very solid backhand i have a pretty solid forehand as well 
but maybe a little loopy sometimes. Um, I think if you can check out like that, I've been able to flatten out my forehands a bit more. Um, if you can see my transition game going forward, taking the ball a little earlier than I used to, um, that would be cool if you guys can see that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure that I know we actually yeah, have yeah. some big tennis fans here, so I'll make sure I'll put them and then they can send you some videos. Be like, this was your opportunity to transition in and you didn't go in. <laughs> At four <laughs> three, or you did a great job uh, attacking in this position, flattening out that four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have some <laughs> tennis fans here, so I'll, I'll, put, I'll push them on it. Um, what, based on uh, your rest of the year, if, uh, if it continues to go normally, what are you, I mean, I, I guess I'll, I'll skip at this question because this year just seems crazy. What tournament do you look for the most? Like what is your, if you're going to win a Grand Slam, where do you think you have the best chance? What is the, what is the surface that you look forward to playing the most? Um, I think either Roland Garros or U.S. Open would be the best chances for me because those two are the ones that have the highest bouncing courts, but also that are not very skidding fast. So I'm able to use my height and make the ball bounce higher. That usually, you know, makes the opponents very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it's a little harder to do that in Wimbledon <laughs> on grass. Um, Australia has been a pretty fast condition slam the last few years. So I think uh, Roland Garros or US Open, well, I guess Roland Garros is a tournament that I've always really dreamed about when I was a kid. But then also New York is the place I was born, so I would, you know, I wouldn't really mind doing it in either of those places. <laughs> yeah. No, that's yeah. good. That's good. And since we're at that, if, 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 you know, since you talk about dreaming as a kid, who do you beat in the finals? Is it Rafa? It's got to be Rafa French. If you can take out Rafa in the finals of French, you know, like this yeah. guy, yeah, like, yeah. that would be the <laughs> ideal situation. I don't know. What yeah, about yeah, US yeah. Open? Who, do, who, do you, who would you want to play? Or you're like, I don't I care. You, uh, U.S. Open, I wouldn't really care who. Yeah, I guess for French, it's, you know, definitely Rafa. No. Or it doesn't have to be the final, but I want to beat Rafa on the way. I like it. I like you it. You know? <laughs> I like it. Well, yeah, from, yeah. From, from my standpoint, I really, really, really appreciate your time. Um, I know everyone right, here is, uh, is, is grateful. Where can people, where can people connect with you? Um, where can they reach out to you if they want to? Yeah. I mean, I have Instagram, I have Twitter, you know, yeah. it's all under my name, Taro Daniel. So yeah, I mean, yeah. Check me out on my page or whatever. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Uh, you know, hopefully you guys can follow, keep following my career and, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for listening to me talk for a few minutes here. <laughs> no, we really appreciate it. And then we'll put on a challenge next time you visit Philly and visit Kana, then you have to come to yeah, the for sure, for sure. see some of these kids as well. So Yeah, yeah. For thank, sure. you, thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Guys, you get to have an amazing experience with a professional tennis player that's gone through an amazing journey and is still going through. So thank you so much for your time and uh, best of luck. Be safe. No, thanks a lot. You guys too, and uh, good luck. And yeah, stay 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 safe.